Today we're going to talk about time series data sets. This is one of the most common of the common special cases, I would say. And I'm actually just feeling like we maybe kind of need two lectures on this, but we're going to squeeze everything into one. Um, and so the particular data set that I picked and sort of, anyways, the particular data set that I picked is this RAIN in Australia data set. And what it is, is that you're trying to predict if it's going to rain tomorrow uh, or not. And you have all these measurements taken in various parts of Australia um, and all these weather measurements for today. And also, did it rain today and some other stuff. Um, and what we have here is this date column, which is basically the main focus of today's class. And it's just super, super, super common to have time series data sets. Um, oh, someone's asking, this data set was used on last year's midterm, yes. Uh, but in last year's midterm, the time column was just ignored. And so the data set wasn't fully done justice, I guess. Um, but today we're really going to focus on the, on the uh, time series, on the time aspect. Okay, so yeah, what we're going to try to figure out today is um, can the date time information help us predict the target value? Because we could just take a normal supervised learning approach to this problem. It's a tabular data set. We haven't really talked about how to encode the date column, but I guess you could just drop it if you didn't want it. Uh, but we, can, we should actually use it um, rather than just throwing it away. And the other thing we'll talk about is forecasting. So, um, well, in a sense, what we're doing is already forecasting because we're trying to predict whether it will rain tomorrow. But we'll talk a little bit about forecasting even further into the future. So can I predict it will rain three days from now or something like that? Um, and just a fun fact about this data set is that it appears one of the days got 371 uh, centimeters of rain, which is just kind of crazy. Um, Maybe that's millimeters. That yeah, maybe I thought it was centimeters. Anyway, a lot of rain. That seems it couldn't be three meters. Um, okay, so parsing date times. I posted on the course readme that kind of humorous video um, about date times. Where was it? Um, this thing. If you want to watch. Whoops. Um, well, anyway, you don't really have to watch it, but date times are just the most giant pain ever. So think about all the possible formats and then all the ambiguities and the slashes and the dashes and the orders and the times and the formats and the daylight savings and the time zones. So, um, this is, uh, okay. This, this is really, um, a pain, but luckily Panda is going to do it for us. Someone's saying in the chat that this is in millimeters. Okay, that makes more sense. Not four meters of rain in a day. Um, thanks for checking that. So in Pandas, there's a two date time function. If I take the rain column, uh, it'll do its best of parsing them. In, and you can see the type is now date time 64. So uh, most of the time, it'll just figure it out for you. And you don't have to deal with this stuff. But please do not try to deal with this stuff yourself because it'll end up being way harder than you think. Uh, use pandas or some kind of tool to do it for you. So once it's in this date time data type, you can do things like subtract two date times and it'll tell you how far apart they are. Um, right, we just did that. Um, You can use greater than, so this is, is later than that. Um, you can take the difference between them and, and tell it to convert into seconds. And so you can do all these kinds of useful things. Um, rather than actually doing the two date time for the column though, to make it even slightly more convenient for yourself, uh, when you're reading the CSV, you can tell it if a particular column is a date column and then it'll just immediately uh, read it in in the date date time 64 format. Questions or comments? Okay. 
So um, next thing we're going to talk about is chain test splits. And so this is the usual thing we do, right? We call scikit-learn's chain test split, and then we do some feature preprocessing, maybe some imputation, some scaling, some one-hot encoding, all that good stuff that we're used to doing, column transformer, blah, blah, blah. Don't need to read through all this mess right now. Uh, I've already separated the features for you into the different types. And we can we can see what our, the usual stuff that you, we're used to doing. Um, and so we can do all this. Um, we can get a train and a test and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's something not quite right here. Um, so any about how I split the data. Any guesses about that? There's a question, would we care about time zones if the sources aren't from the same place? Yeah, so um, you would need to figure that out. Um, I mean, hopefully the timestamp would have like a time zone in it, like UTC minus seven or something. But in this case, we're not looking at times, we're just looking at dates. Uh, using data from the future to predict past events. Yeah, so that's it's not exactly what we're doing, but that's almost what we're doing. And the, the, the problem here is, is pretty subtle. Um, so for every time we make a prediction, we're using the information about a given day to predict the next day. So for a particular prediction, we're never actually using, we're never actually getting to see what is the weather two weeks from now when we predict whether it's going to rain tomorrow. But when we did a random train test split, the problem is the training set does contain days from the future and days from the past. And the test set contains all kinds of days. And so when I predict on the test set, even though if the, if the test date is like January 1st, 2010, I only get to look at the weather on January 1st, 2010 to predict the wet weather will rain on January 2nd. But the model itself was trained on data from 2012 or 2013. And so it's, it's still not quite right. You don't really want to let the model see what's happening in the future. Because think about deployment, right? We would like tests to mirror deployment. But in deployment, if I'm literally using this today to predict, predict the weather for tomorrow, November 11th, I can't use a model that was trained from 2021 or 2022, because that hasn't happened yet. I don't have that information yet. And so it's not a realistic reflection of what deployment will be. In deployment, the model will have only been trained on data from you know, 2005 up to 2020 or whatever. Um, and so we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't train test split randomly. Otherwise, when you're predicting on the test set, your model will have been trained on some data from after some of that test set. Uh, someone's asking if we have a random split. So yeah, um, train test split does a random split. So it shuffles, which is very important. And we want that most of the time. But here with time series, there are these extra issues that get introduced. OK, so yeah, the train um, goes up to 2017, and the test starts from 2007. Um, should we consider the relationship between the previous two or more days? We'll get to that later today. OK, yeah. So this isn't like massive cheating. It's not like predict whether it's going to rain tomorrow, and you already know whether it's going to rain tomorrow. Like That would be ridiculous, but it's kind of minor cheating uh, that we want to avoid. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this. OK, so I just subsetted it to one of the locations, Sydney, Australia. And I've labeled the train in blue and the test in red. And so, well, this is kind of what you would expect for a random split, is that the test data spans the entire decade and the train data spans the entire decade. And that's not really what we want. OK, so <clears throat> excuse me, how much data do we have in this data set? We have about 10 years, I guess, nine and a half years of data in this data set. So we can decide, if we want to avoid this, we can decide, OK, we're going to save the last two years in the data for test, for example. And so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to say the test set is things after June uh, 30th, 2015. 
and the training data is that and everything before. And so if I split like this, now I'm replacing scikit-learn train test split with my own code that's splitting by date. So I get my 100,000 training examples and 34,000 test examples. And so I have around 25% of the data as tests, which is kind of normal, like what we would do with scikit-learn. I think the default is 20%. But now when I make that same plot for Sydney, um, you can see that all the train is earlier and all the test is later. And that's kind of, um, that's good. So people always get confused here. So I want to try to emphasize this very carefully. If I'm predicting on my test set, for example, this date here, January 1st, 2017, will it rain the next day, January 2nd, 2017? The features I get are gonna be the features from January 1st, 2017. But the coefficients in the model, if I'm using logistic regression, say the coefficients were only derived from, where's my pen? The coefficients were only derived from the training portion, from pre the splitting, because I only got to look at the blue stuff to train my model to call fit, which is going to get me the coefficients. So when I'm predicting here, say, I'm trying to predict whether it will rain on January 2nd, 2017, I get to look at the weather conditions from January 1st, 2017, because that's our whole task to begin with, given the weather today, will it rain tomorrow? So the weather measurements, the X going in comes from Jan January 1st, 2017, but the coefficients only came from information prior to June, 2015, because that's the training set. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, right, so I can now just do all the same stuff again that I did before. Um, and yeah, here it seems like the score didn't change that much um, because it, it wasn't that major of a cheating, I guess. Um, but we still want to kind of do things right in this course so that we have good habits because sometimes, sometimes it will matter. Um, and furthermore, oh yeah, let's leave it at that. Okay. So we can do all the usual things we do. We can look at feature importances. Um, we can do dummy classifier and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it seems like 77% is what dummy classifier gets. I'm assuming that's gonna be not raining. I hope it doesn't rain 77% of the days in Australia. Um, Right, so it usually doesn't rain, but sometimes it rains. Okay, so now cross-validation. So I haven't talked about cross-validation yet because it's kind of a hassle because cross-validation is all about random splitting, right? You randomly split into your five or your 10 folds or whatever. Um, and we don't really want to deal with that because uh, of the reason we just talked about. We want our train portion to be before our test portion. And so there is, uh, scikit-learn has this time series split. Let me click on the link here. Okay, so scikit-learn has this time series split. And where did that figure go? Here's basically what it does. So take a look at especially this top part of the figure. Um, so what it's showing here, I know scikit-learn likes to use this terminology of testing, which kind of annoys me because really validation. But what happened, the, the way the splits work in this time series split is here's your first fold at the top. Your first fold, you take the first chunk for train and the second chunk for test. And in the next fold, you take a longer chunk for train and the next fold for test. And then in the third fold, you take an even longer chunk. So basically, it is similar to regular cross validation in that each chunk gets to take its turn as the validation set but it's different from regular cross-validation because you, you don't use everything else for train. You use only the stuff before it for train. And that's what you're seeing here. Questions about this?
Uh, what is the group line? I don't actually know at the bottom. Um, the first fold would always be used for train. Right, so that, that's right. Um, you can't use like the very first thousand time points for test because there would be nothing before. Wouldn't more training data mean better results generally? Yeah, that's a great point. So normally when we do cross-validation, we kind of expect like the 10 folds to get around the same results. And we've looked at the standard deviation and said how different they are. Here, that's all out the window because you actually expect better results for the folds that use more training data. And so, um, we, so some of that intuition from before goes away. Yes, that's correct. But it's still theoretically better than just a straight up uh, train test split or a train validation split. I mean, you could do a single train validation split as well if you wanted, which is like, for example, just this fold number three here, you could just do that. Um, but you, this time series split could potentially be useful. All right. Um, so yeah, I'm, I experimented around with this a lot in the last few days and got some kind of crazy looking results. And I think I've figured everything out by now, but um, here's the thing about this rain in Australia data set. Um, there's actually multiple time series in this data set. What do I mean by that? Um, a particular date in this data set, like December 1st, 2008, Actually, ugh. Um, yeah, this is really what I want to show first. If I sort by date, um, you'll see that there's multiple training examples with the same date, uh, 2015, June 30th. And the reason for that is that there's a measurement per day per location. So at all these different places in Australia, they took a measurement on that day. And so what that means is we don't just have a single time series. By single time series, I mean kind of like something evolving over time with one measurement per date, but we kind of have a different time series for every uh, location. And that makes all the cross validation a little bit more complicated. Because if you just use time series split in scikit-learn, it's going to assume that your data set is ordered by time. So it's going to grab a chunk and then it's going to grab another chunk. But actually, when we just loaded up this data set from Kaggle, it wasn't sorted by time. It was sorted by location. And then within location, it was sorted by time. So the rows were all the, the measurements for Albury in order, and then all the measurements from the next place, Canberra or whatever in order, and then all the measurements for the next place in order. And so it was not actually in order by time. Uh, at least by default when we loaded it up. And so um, you could sort by time if you want. Um, and then you could use this time series split and that should work. I should mention the syntax here that um, the CV argument in cross val score or cross validate, we've been setting that to an integer all this time, like CV equals five, CV equals 10. But in addition to setting to an integer, you can also set it to like a cross validation, a splitting object like I've done here. Um, and that's how I tell it. So I don't use a completely different function called like time series cross val score. I just use the regular cross val score, but I tell it the type of splitting I want uh, uh, like this. Okay, so um, I did a lot of experiments about this and that's what all this is here, but I don't think it's a good use of time looking at the time because there's some more important stuff to talk about. Um, are there questions about this, uh, what we've done so far? Okay, so if you're interested, you can read it over later. Basically, I did cross validation with the time series split, with the with the shuffling split, and with the no shuffling split. And uh, I was pretty surprised at the results um, that the one with no shuffling did did worse. Um, and I think I figured it out. And I, anyway, I, I was it wasn't that I wasn't that into spending a lot of time on this. So let's move on. 
um, encoding daytime as a feature. So last time we talked about feature engineering and someone was saying, let's, we want to see more feature engineering in this course. And what I was trying to say is feature engineering is probably the most domain specific or one of the most domain specific aspects of machine learning. And so this section encoding daytime as a feature is basically feature engineering for your date column, feature engineering for time series. Um, and even here, we're just kind of uh, getting to the tip of the iceberg. And so what we're going to talk about is, can we, so we've talked about different encodings. We've taken a categorical variable and turned it into a one hot encoding. We've taken a numeric variable. We haven't really done much to it, just scaled it. How can we take the date variable and turn it into one or more columns of numbers so that we can just throw that into our regular classifiers and everything will work? So that's what we're going to talk about now. And here's the first way I'm going to suggest. Well, OK, approach zero is just drop the date column. But there's presumably some useful information in there. Um, so what we're going to do first is just encode the date as a number. So for example, um, in this case, there might not be as significant trends. I mean, I don't know about climate change and such, but I don't know if there's significantly different amounts of rain in Australia. like now versus a decade ago versus two decades ago. Um, but for other kinds of things, like another data set I'll show you later, there's definitely trends. And so a simple thing you can do is just encode time as a number. So someone's saying, uh, just use Unix time. And so that's basically the same thing as what I'm doing. Um, I'm replacing the date with uh, the number of days since the first day of the data set, which is November 1st, 2007. It doesn't really matter if you do days or seconds or whatever, um, because it can all get scaled and normalized afterwards anyway. So uh, I can make such a feature. And let's find it. Oh, no. <sighs> Okay, I see it got scaled. Uh, that's why. Um, but is it over here? There it is. Okay, there's our feature. So days since. So the first one's going to have zero, then one, then two, then three, then four. Um, someone asked uh, ordinal encoding. So this is, this is okay. This is the same as ordinal. En it's not exactly ordinal encoding, but it's similar. Um, but another question is whether we have equally spaced time points or not, because we might not. So we don't necessarily just want to use an integer index, one, two, three, four, five, because maybe the measurements they measure after a day and then after a month. And so it'd be better to put the actual time uh, rather than just an integer index. But furthermore, remember we have multiple time series here. So we don't want, when it starts in Canberra, we don't want to keep counting up. We want to go back to zero because the date goes back to zero. So some things to watch out for there. Um, okay, so we can do all our stuff. We can we can compute train. And I'm not going to do the cross validation thing kind of throughout. I'll just do train and test out of laziness. Um, but at least we talked about the cross validation. Yeah, so we can do this. Um, I'll just warn you that for the next like 10 minutes, I'm going to make all kinds of features that I personally think are a good idea, but the scores don't really change much, um, which is kind of a frustration I have with this data set. So. Whatever I threw at this data set, I wasn't really able to get much better than like 85% accuracy. Um, and so probably one day I'll just get fed up and abandon this data set. But I'm going to tell you about things that make sense. Uh, you're just not going to be that blown away by the scores in this case. OK, so how about other ways to generate features from the date column? Um, yeah. So. You could do the month. Um, so for example, how, how might we encode the date or how might we encode the month? Or even why might the month be relevant? I, I think the month might be relevant because if you tell me the weather in Vancouver and then ask me to predict if it's raining tomorrow, but then you furthermore told me it's November, I would say, give it a higher chance of raining tomorrow than if you told me that same weather, but you told me it's in August, I'll say, yeah, yeah, probably not really August. I don't know, it doesn't rain that much in August. So that's the idea of putting in the month. So I'm seeing some ideas in the chat. 
And yeah, this one's a little bit messed up. Month, uh, okay, uh, lots of good ideas in the chat. And I'm gonna talk about all of those. But yeah, month is a real pain because what is it? Is it an integer? Is it a categorical variable? So you can do a one hot encoding um, and basically, uh, okay, how should I say this? First, you need to make the column itself. And uh, if you do this, It'll, it, you can use um, Python to get you the actual name of the month and then you'll do one hot encoding. Um, I want to leave it like this. Oh gosh. I'm going to leave it like this, but I'm still going to one hot encode it. Um, I, sh I should really change that. It's just so confusing. Okay, um, yes, so I can one hot encode it. And I have this preprocess features function, by the way, that I wrote above. And by just telling it that month is a categorical feature, it'll one hot encode it. If I told it month was part of the list of numeric features, it would just scale it. So that's how I'm doing all this uh, from a code point of view. So yeah, I can do all this. Um, I can look at the coefficients because I'm doing logistic regression. Uh, I can look at the coefficients of the different months. And so you can see, apparently, there's like some rainier months, uh, maybe in our summer, their winter. And in our winter, their summer, you see some negative coefficients. I wonder why I started with two. Why not start with one? Um, so in our winter, their summer, there seems to be some negative coefficients, which means less rain, which kind of makes sense because less rain in summer. So that's all good. That makes, that makes sense. Um, and then people have been asking about ordinal. So yeah, that's the whole interesting thing about month is that if you don't one hot encode it, if you ordinal encode it, meaning if you leave it as the integers one through 12, there's this discontinuity between 12 and one. Month is almost ordinal, like, you know, average, good, excellent, but excellent isn't similar to horrible, right? But January is similar to December. And so, if you ordinal encode month, meaning if you just leave it as these integers, basically, then you give it the ordering information, which is useful for the model to have, but you don't give it the wraparound information. You teach it that December is very different from January. And so, for example, if it's learning, if this is just one ordinal encoded column and you're using a linear model like logistic regression, it has to come up with a single coefficient for that column. And so if that coefficient is positive, it means like, as you move towards December, it's rainier, but then that's so messed up because it's saying January is the least rainy and December is the most rainy and you just get more and more rain and, and that's messed up. And so, so month is one of the most interesting kind of case studies for this encoding thing. Um, and I don't love the idea of ordinal encoding for the reason I just mentioned. I also don't love the idea of one hot encoding because there is actually an ordering to the months and we're throwing away that information and making the model learn everything from scratch. The model now doesn't know that February is between January and March, which is also annoying. Um, we'll talk about some ways of dealing with that as well. But yeah, another thing you could do is you could do the season. So for example, maybe there's just winter and summer. So in Australia, maybe the winter months are May through September, and we could just make a binary feature that's just winter or summer. It's kind of, it kind of solves both of those problems, but you now throw away whether it was May or September, which might have been useful. So it's hard to win with these things. Um, but maybe you decide to include this and the one hot encoded month. And now you can start to see where feature engineering is like a bottomless pit of deciding what to do um, and very, very domain specific. So here I have my, my winter thing. Um, I really like to look at it. Yeah, so here it's just telling you if it's winter or not. Um, yeah, okay, that's fine. Do we have some at the bottom that are, yeah, these ones are, these ones are Australian winter and these ones are not. Um, okay, and again, we can, you know, get our scores. And as I was mentioning, I wasn't really seeing a lot of interesting movement in the scores with these approaches. Um, but it is fun to look at the coefficients. So um, here you have a positive coefficient for winter, 
which means knowing that it's winter makes it more more likely to predict rain, which kind of makes sense. So that's cool. Yeah, it's cool other than the fact that the scores don't seem to really change, um, which kind of tells me the information about a winter is like kind of being a little redundant compared to the other information it already has access to or something like that. Um, so here's the amount of rain and you can kind of see some seasonality here. Like these are presumably, you see kind of a up and down every year, which are, which are the seasons, which makes sense. And I should mention that pandas is really nice about this, like, oh, that's actually not even, let me just try one thing. Since I've updated, upgraded my pandas skills since I last taught this, will this make a prettier plot? Yeah, I would say that's a little nicer. Okay. Um, and does this, sorry, maybe no one really is interested in this, but is that actually, oh, hey, that's beautiful. Okay. Um, I like this plot a bit better because all the dates are just jammed together here in a big mess. Um, anyways, yeah, pandas is very generous. And when you plot it, it uh, actually knows what dates are and all that. So that's cool. Um, so here we have the monthly, here I'm just kind of doing some exploratory data analysis to analyze why this happened with the winter and summer and everything. So you can see the average rainfall is a bit lower in the summer, but like kind of a weird looking, not, not as smooth of a curve as I would have expected. I would have expected something more like smoothly periodic. Um, yeah, anyways. So I, I thought maybe it was like in different regions. Maybe if I just looked at one part of Australia, like Canberra, um, that maybe I would see some like better trends. But even this is so weird. Like why, why is it like raining a lot in February and then not a lot in January and then a lot again in December? Um, I find that for a particular location in Australia, I found that, found that pretty weird. So maybe someone knows better than me. Um, Okay, let me read some stuff in the chat. Is it using our winter or their winter aren't the season in Australia? Um, yeah, so I, I hard coded in what I considered winter, which was month five to nine, May to September. Yeah, anyways, I, I don't really know why the, the data is so weird looking because it's not even that small of a data set. That's the funny thing. Like for Canberra, we have what? I guess 2000 isn't that much, but still a lot of days. Like that's like 10 years of data. Um, oh, well. Okay. Yeah, skipping, skipping. Okay. Um, so another thing you could do, which generated a lot of confusion last year, and uh, maybe I'll quickly show it and leave further discussion to Piazza in the interest of time, is what a, a periodic encoding. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm basically going to use the sine and cosine of the, the day or the month um, so that I'll have a feature in there. And the feature kind of goes up and then back down. Um, and I can use that. The theoretical motivation here is to kind of get the both, best of both worlds about the wrapping around things. So if you have these sine and cosine features, then you should, you should both be giving it information about the ordering of the times of years, but also not worry about the discontinuity between December and January. Um, and so the features kind of look like this. I basically give it two columns, um, one that's like sine of the month and one that's a cosine of the month. And if you have both of these columns, um, there's some nice kind of mathematical properties here that you can like go back and figure out what, what month it was. Um, but I feel like based on last time, the amount of, it wasn't worth going into this fully. I think it's a lower priority than some of the other stuff I want to talk about today. But if you're interested, you can look into this more carefully. And I also put in a like Piazza question from last year where I tried to elaborate a little bit more. So let me skip past that. Um, another thing I tried, I think I'm getting to the end here of this like giant list of things I tried, which is basically what you're watching. Um, well, 
I'm just thinking about the time. Um, let me read this question in the chat first. Still wouldn't change. Isn't this periodic thing only a concern with linear models? Like if we're dealing with the tree-based model, we don't need to mess with any of this. I don't really agree with that. So even the tree-based model is doing splits. So it's if you pass in an ordinal encoded month, it's going to do something like if month greater than seven. And so then all month greater than seven will be like taken together, but that still deals, doesn't deal with the fact that December and January are next to each other. So it's not just for linear models. For any kind of model, it's useful for it to know that December and January are next to each other, um, but it's also useful for it to know that January comes before February, comes before March. So this goes back to a discussion we had a long time ago about like putting in prior information as a human. If you had infinite amounts of data, then you could just one hot encode the month and it would figure everything out. Or you could even one hot encode the day. If you really had infinite amounts of data, sure, it can learn a separate thing for every single day if it really wants to. But because we have finite amounts of data, we don't have enough data for it to actually learn about February 3rd or even about February necessarily. Um, and so we want to give it this information rather than making it relearn from scratch something that we already know as humans, which is that these months are in order and they wrap around. And so any feature engineering we can do to, to help it along uh, is generally going to help generalization because we don't have infinite amounts of data. If you have missing data in this data set with the time being an important feature, would it make sense to use nearest neighbors? to impute the missing data with the mean of the nearest neighbors. Um, yeah, I, I guess you could do that. Um, or you could impute like something on the same day for the previous year or something like that, um, which, which could be the neighbor if you define neighbor as, as that way. Um, so sure, you could get into fancier uh, ways of dealing with missing data here. Okay, so I'm just looking at the time and this feature engineering just goes on and on, but I think I'd rather call the break here because uh, I think we're getting into diminishing returns and there's lots to talk about after the break. So let's stop here. We'll resume at 11.44 and there's lots more to talk about. So someone asked near the beginning about half an hour ago, shouldn't we use information from two days ago. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about in this next section. So right now we're looking at features about today to predict tomorrow, whether it's going to rain or not tomorrow. But um, what about using information from yesterday? So if I had to pick only between today or yesterday, I'd pick today because that's the closest to tomorrow. But I don't necessarily have to pick. I could use the weather information from today and yesterday and if the one from yesterday is useful, great, like bring it on board, why not, right? So that's a really common thing to do in time series. Um, and so let me recreate my train and test sets. Um, okay, so here's my, my training data again. And um, what I'm gonna do so I have this code that we don't need to look at right now, but it creates this um, feature that is so-called lag. So meaning like from one time step before or two time steps before. Um, and so let me show you the result of this code because the code itself is a mess. Um, so here's just a subset of the columns so we can take a look at it easier. And so of the training set. So we have the date as we had before, we have the location, and then we have the rainfall today um, at, in millimeters, I believe. And then we have the rainfall yesterday, which I'm calling lag of one, meaning it's one time step behind uh, the current one. And so what you can see is that on the very first day of the data set, December 1st, 2008, yesterday's rainfall is missing data because that's the first day of the entire data set. We don't have any data from before. And so you can you could drop this from the training set entirely, which I think would be reasonable, or you could try to do some sort of imputation or depending on how you want to handle this. Um, and then you can see that for December 2nd, 
yesterday's rainfall 0.6 is actually the rainfall from yesterday. Zero matches zero, one matches one, 2.2 .2 matches 0.2. So you have this kind of diagonal relationship because the rainfall today for a given day is yesterday's rainfall the day after. Any questions about this? So um, I should say, okay, so this data set's a little bit, so for this data set, the way it's set up, the target is whether or not it's gonna rain tomorrow, yes or no. And one of the features is whether or not it rained uh, today, yes or no. But then another one of the features is how much did it rain today? So um, you can take the target value itself, like whether or not it is gonna rain tomorrow. And you can make lagged versions of that, like from today, from yesterday, from the day before. Or you, you, so what I'm trying to say is you can create lagged versions of the target of the thing you're trying to predict, or you can create lagged versions of whatever features you want. You can say, what was the humidity four days ago? What was the wind speed seven days ago? Those are all features you can basically engineer in a time series problem. And then you have to decide if they're actually useful. And so then you could do feature selection, you could look at the coefficients, you could use a simpler model so it doesn't overfit. All the stuff we talked about in the whole course, um, you can kind of, you can generate as many features as you want this way by looking at 10 days ago or whatever, but at some point it'll become useless and you'll just start overfitting to those most likely. And there's some more rigorous kind of time series analysis ways of thinking about this, but we're just going to do all this with our supervised learning hat on and not really worry about that. Okay, so this is just to show you that I was careful in the function that I wrote. So when it switches from one location to the other, it doesn't accidentally take this value and put it here. Cause actually for Badgeries Creek, we just don't have anything before January 1st, 2009. So we want this man here. Uh, so one question is, is it okay to do this to the test set? Um, so in the test set, is it okay to um, look at the day before and put that in? And it's, it's kind of a question of, um, I, I think it, it's, it's fine to do that because if I'm, if I'm actually doing this today, like November 10th, 2020, and I wanna to predict tomorrow on November 11th, 2020, then sure, I am, that, that's my deployment, then sure, I do have that information. Like I know what it was today and yesterday and the day before and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's gonna be a nuance with this that we'll talk about a few minutes from now. And so we'll just leave this for now. Um, yeah, okay, this is kind of a, a not important subtlety. So I'm gonna skip past that for now. Okay, so here's my new, my new data set that has this lagged feature in it of the rainfall from yesterday. And so now I can do everything all over again. I can fit my model, I can get my scores, I can look at the feature importances. And what, what I really want to look at is the feature importances for these two features, the amount of rain today and the amount of rain yesterday. And so this looks healthy. I'm happy to see this. So let me digest this with you all. So this says that the amount of rain today in millimeters has a positive coefficient when trying to decide whether it's gonna to rain tomorrow. That seems to make sense to me. If it rained crazy amounts today, I'm more likely to predict rain tomorrow than if it didn't rain at all today. And then you have the rainfall from yesterday having a positive but smaller coefficient, which to me um, seems reasonable, but Okay, I want to try to, this, this is a very subtle but important point. If I didn't have this rainfall today feature, if I didn't know anything about today and I only knew about yesterday, then I would expect to see a bigger coefficient here. Because if the only thing I knew about, yes, knew about was yesterday, that's gonna be very valuable information. And I'd really like to use that and give it a high coefficient, a high importance. But remember what we talked about with feature importances a couple of weeks back, 
all the feature importances are in the context of all the other features. And so what this is saying is in a kind of hand wavy way, if I know how much it rained today and I already took that into account and gave it a 0.08 coefficient and kind of squeezed out the information I could from the fact that it rained today, even given that it's useful to know if it rained tomorrow and if it rained, sorry, yesterday. And if it rained yesterday, I'm gonna boost up my prediction even higher. So um, that's kind of saying like, if it's been raining for a couple of days now, that's even more predictive of it raining tomorrow than it's only been raining for one day now. But you could have had this coefficient be negative. So here's, here's imagine a, a, a place where um, it only ever rains for two days at a time. It like never rains for three days at a time. In that place, you might have a positive coefficient here and a negative coefficient there because it's basically saying, well, if it, if it rained today, sure, it could rain tomorrow as well. But if it rained today and yesterday, I really don't think it's gonna to rain tomorrow because it never rains three days in a row. Then you would have a negative coefficient for yesterday's rain. And so different types of time series and different types of um, data sets will have different types of coefficients for these lagged features. And you will not always have that if this one is positive, then all the other ones are going to be positive. So it's a subtle but important point. Are there questions about that? Anyone? Okay. Um, yeah, so I already talked about this. We could also build a lag version of the target. Our data set in a sense already has that in that we're predicting rain tomorrow and one of our features is rain today. Um, but we could add in lots of features. So we could add in rainfall from yesterday rainfall from two days ago, rainfall from three days ago, humidity from yesterday. Um, and you could, yeah, you could put it all in the data frame. And look at the, the NANDs here. So if you're using rainfall lag three, then it's going to be NAND for the first three days in the data set, because that's rainfall from three days ago. You're not going to know that on the first day of the data set or the second day or the third day. But by the fourth day of the data set, you know the rainfall from three days ago because that's the first day of the data set. So you get these kind of diagonal patterns. Would monthly trends be captured via lag, like a more rainy March leads to a more rainy April, or is that through a different method? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So how should I say this? Um, a little bit in the sense that uh, if you tend to have lots of rain near each other and you know that it rained the last five days, then, um, then, then you may predict it's more likely to rain tomorrow. But the question is still to ask yourself, if it rained the last five days and I'm trying to predict whether it's raining tomorrow, does it help me further to know that it's November right now and not August? And if it does, the month is still going to be useful on top of that. So it's all about, is there additional information to be had by adding this other feature, given all the information I already have? That's kind of how to think about it. How would we create a lag data set if we wanted to predict, say, X days into the future? Okay, we're going to talk about that later today. Um, great question. Would there be a value in aggregating the rainfall in the past three days, i.e. a moving average? Absolutely. People do that kind of stuff all the time. Moving average features. Like the feature engineering for time series is really endless. There's so much you can do. And those are all um, things that people do actually do. So one of the things I skipped. Yeah, anyway, there, yeah, there's, there's lots of that. Okay, so I can do that. 
I can put all these things in. I hope I print out the coefficients. Yeah, I'm actually, I don't remember what the coefficients were, but now I'm very curious to see them. Um, see, that's so interesting. Look at that. Again, I want you to be, not read too much into these coefficients and make statements about the real world because of all the reasons we talked about before. But this is so interesting. So this seems to say even rain lag two and three is useful, all those smaller coefficients. So it does seem like if it's rained for a bunch of days, that makes it more likely to rain the next day or to predict that. But with humidity, you get the other way around. That's so interesting. So if it was humid at 3 p.m. today, it's going to be more likely to predict humidity. But if, if it was humid, on top of that, if it was humid, uh, high humidity the day before, that gives it a lower value. Again, all the caveats, that may not be the way the world works, but that's what's going on in the brain of our model, which is still very interesting for us to look at and think about. Any questions? Okay, so this is what someone just asked about, forecasting further into the future. So this is a very interesting kind of sub thing for us to talk about. Um, so let's say we want to predict seven days into the future instead of one day, which, you know, whether like you might be interested in the weather next Tuesday. Um, that introduces new complications of what we haven't talked about yet. So one approach is to just say, you know what, I'm going to train a completely separate model for our um, rains a week from now. So our original data set, original data set, the target column, I can't even, it was rain tomorrow. This was our target here. But instead I could just change that to be rain next week. And I could construct a data set where the target column is, did it rain a week after that day? And that's totally fine. I have, if I have historical records of rain, I can construct that data set because I know on all the weather on a given day, I know whether it rained seven days after that. So I can absolutely construct such a data set where the target is, did it rain seven days later? And that is one valid approach to this, but it's a little annoying because you might actually want to make a forecast for, is it going to rain tomorrow? What's the probability it'll rain tomorrow and the next day and the day after that and the day after that and the day after that. So according to this, you'd have to build seven completely separate models. One to learn whether it'll rain tomorrow, one to learn whether it'll rain in two days, one to learn whether it'll rain three days, which is fine. And actually the approach I'm going to recommend to you um, but it's kind of a hassle because you just need to make all these different models. So there are also some other approaches to this um, that you can use. So one is, um, we don't talk about it in CPSC 330, but there are machine learning um, classifiers and regressors and models that can allow for multiple outputs. So we always have, you give it a bunch of features X, however many features you want, given that predict one thing either a single number or a single category. But sometimes you want to predict multiple things. And that's pretty popular with uh, deep learning. I think it can also be done with the tree-based models. And so you could make one of these multi-output machine learning models that jointly predicts what the probability that it's going to rain tomorrow and the day after and the day after and the day after and the day after that. And then you don't need like seven different models to keep track of at the same time. And it's a little more convenient. It should be faster. You don't need to call fit seven times um, and predict seven times and all that kind of stuff. So that's something I'll just put on your radar, but we don't really cover how to do it in this course. Um, and the third way is this sequential prediction um, one day at a time. And basically the way it works is that I predict for tomorrow and then, well, well, okay. But let me first pause there and take questions and then we'll dig into approach number three more. Um, I guess this question is probably referring to net one versus two. Is it more convenient or are there more fundamental differences? My personal opinion is that the accuracy of approach two will probably not be much higher than for approach one, if at all, 
it's more of a matter of convenience and speed. The training will be a lot faster because it'll just have one big model and the prediction will be faster, but I don't expect vastly different accuracies between method one and method two. Method three is actually fundamentally different and, and maybe better or, or worse, but let's talk about it now. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna change data sets on you for a minute because um, the RAIN data set is a bit too crazy to talk about approach three. And so I'm gonna switch to this uh, retail sales from clothing stores data set. Um, and the reason I'm gonna switch to it is because it only has one, it only has a target, it has no features. You have the date, you have the number of sales. So you don't have to deal with all the lots and lots of features, which make things a lot more confusing. So here's what it looks like if I, so it goes from 1992 to 2020 and it looks like this. So these are some retail sales um, over time. Excuse me. And um, all we're going to do is given the information up to now, like forecasting the future. How many sales do I think there's? I think these are grouped month, month by month. Each point is a month. So how many sales do I expect next month? How many sales do I expect the month after next month? Um, and this is going to be a little bit easier to explain approach number three with this single variable data set, just the number of sales, not like the humidity and the weather and the wind and the rain and all that kind of stuff, which makes it more of a mess. Okay, so we, in this case, we, can, we don't have any other features other than the, tar than the target. Um, and so we can make these lag features and that's gonna be all, the only features we can really make here are features made out of the date, like we talked about before, turn the date into an integer, one hot and cut the month, whatever, or we can make features of the target because that's all we have available. So we can lag the target. So we can make a, da a data set like this, that what we're trying to predict is how many sales there were today. And the features I have are how many sales there were yesterday and the day before and the day before that and the day before that and the day before that. Cause I don't really have any other features to use um, to try to predict the sales for today. Um, and yeah, I can drop the date or I can encode the date. Um, and so let me, I got rid of the missing values. I dropped the date. And so now we just have a regular old data set again. We have the target column on the left. We have five features. It so happens these features come from the lagged features, um, but we want to predict this thing on the left, which is sales. So I split it up into X and Y. And I can just do my usual scikit-learn thing that we're doing this whole course. This, in this case, is a regression because it's the number of sales rather than the Australia one that was a classifier rain or not. So I bring in a regressor and I can just do all the things um, that we're used to doing. So I can, for example, uh, predict, uh, not for the first test point anymore. I can predict on the test data and here is basically my predictions into the future for how many sales I think there's going to be. Um, and I'm just putting that into a data frame for easier viewing. So basically here's my test set. Here's the five features I use for prediction. So in my test set, I had access to these five features for prediction. And uh, here is my prediction. And here's the correct answer, which I'm only using for scoring. Uh, and so it's just a completely regular supervised learning thing so far. But now to get to this question, what if I wanted to predict seven days into the future uh, or something like that? Oops, I need to get out of this. Actually, first let me take questions and then I'll move on to that. Um, just a minute. Multi-output models don't seem to be working, predicting seven days, because I think that each day should have different coefficient, but multi-output seems to use similar coefficient. Well, yeah, that's really outside of the scope here, because we haven't talked about how multi-output models work, but um, they, they can work for this kind of thing. They'll give you different predictions. Would it make sense to use the output from a rain tomorrow? Yes, that's exactly what we're about to do. 
We are going to use the output for our rain tomorrow to help predict rain in two days. That's exactly what this approach three is that we're talking about to get into. Um, how does the model know that the lag features are in fact lagged when it corresponds to the same date? Yeah, so the model doesn't know that. I created this lag, these lagged features, and then I just pass them in as features to whatever I want, logistic regression, random forest. All it's seeing is I got my Y values that I'm trying to predict, and I got my features, my columns. It doesn't know that those features happen to be lagged versions of the target, but it doesn't care. It's just a supervised learning machine. You give it X, you give it Y, it does its thing. And then when it's done, you can go back and look at the coefficients and you can say, oh, but the different coefficients corresponded to the different columns. And so the, this, this coefficient over here corresponds to that column. And you can look at the coefficient and you as a human can interpret what it did, but it didn't know what it was doing while it was doing it. It didn't know that these were lagged features. It just thought they were regular old columns for supervised learning. Uh, how would you cross validate this model? Yeah, so you could do the same kind of time series split thing we talked about earlier uh, if you wanted to. Um, did I answer your question about how did it know that the, the lagged features are in fact lagged? Because I think that was a very important point. Okay, great. Um, all right, so here's kind of the the conceptual moment here. So what if we want to predict seven days in the future? Well, we're, we're, we, can, we can't because the whole way we set things up is that if I want to predict the sales for a given day, I'm going to use the sales from the day before and the day before that and the day before that and the day before that and the day before that. I'm going to look at the previous five days of sales and those are going to be my features to predict the, the sales on a given day. And if I'm predicting seven days from now, like next Tuesday, November 17th, 2020, I need to know the sales on November 16th, 15th, 14th, 13th, and 12th to, to put them into my model, but those haven't happened yet, as we all know, because those are in the future. So what do we do? And as someone suggested in the chat, and that's what people actually do in these situations, is they predict the values and then pretend those are actually the true values. And so for, for an example, let's say today is Monday. I, I just because the beginning of the week, I know it's actually Tuesday. So here's what we want to do. Today's Monday. We want to predict seven days in advance, right? So here's what we do. Our model can only predict one day in advance. That's all it knows how to do. So we predict Tuesday sales. And now we pretend that that's actually what happened tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but we take our prediction and pretend that is actual data. And so then when we want to predict for Wednesday, well, Wednesday needs to know Tuesday, Monday, et cetera. We say, oh, here you go. Here's your, hey, you Wednesday, two days from now, you need to know yesterday's sales. I'm going to give you my prediction and you can pretend that's your yesterday's sales, even though that hasn't happened yet. And so that way you can kind of feed it in and bootstrap itself. And then it can make a prediction for Wednesday by looking at the five days before that, one of which was a made up data point and the four before that were real. And then we need to predict on Thursday and Thursday needs to know all the five days before that. And we can give it Saturday, Sunday, Monday because those have already happened. But for Tuesday and Wednesday, we use our prediction and, and so on and so forth. And we can keep doing that loop and then we can get ourselves to predict seven days in advance without having to make a completely separate model. So we can use a model that's learned to predict one day in advance to predict however many days in advance we want. And that's this approach number three that I mentioned earlier. Um, so questions about that? How's the predict proba on this? Um, so for this sales thing, it's regression. And so there's no predict proba. You could have prediction intervals. For classification, you could have predict proba. Um, and you might or might not set things up to use it, I guess. Does that mean the more into the future we try to predict larger in the air? Absolutely. And I think that's true for probably any forecasting problem that I could possibly think of, is that the more in the future we try to predict, the harder it is. Um, 
Yeah, so I, so Tom, one of my colleagues had this tutorial that I thought it'd be nice to look at briefly because he had these really nice uh, forecasts. So he was, he was forecasting, fifth, this is this exact same sales data set that we were just looking at. And he's forecasting 50 steps ahead, which is the green. So the red is like the training data and the green is the forecast 50 steps ahead. Um, and then the lag is like how many lag features are you using? So this top one is using the last six days. I can zoom in a bit. The top one is using the last six days and then he's doing 50 steps of forecasting into the future. And you can see it kind of doesn't follow the pattern, but uh, when he changes lag to 12, meaning it's looking at the last 12 days, he actually gets these like nice forecasts um, because 12 days is more than a, a, like a week and maybe the sales are, are on a weekly cycle or no, no, these are months. So probably on a yearly cycle. Um, each data point is a month. So if you set lag equals to 12, that means it gets to look at the last year of data. Uh, so that makes sense if there's like season, different times of year and stuff. So once you get to look at the last 12 months of data, you actually kind of get to follow the pattern. And here looking at the last 18 months of data, um, you also get to follow the pattern. So again, these plots are made using that approach number three I mentioned where it's predicting, pretending that prediction is true using it for the next one. And with that, he's able to predict 50 steps in ahead or, or 50 months ahead, uh, which I thought was kind of cool. Questions about that? All right, I'm just gonna plow ahead given the time. Is there a general trend that the more lag features you have, the better your prediction accuracy? Um, I mean, I would say it's probably like for any type of features, it'll probably always improve your training score, but you might start overfitting at some point and looking like a hundred years ago is probably not gonna be useful for generalization. And so you might find something there, but it's probably just overfitting and improving your train score, but not your test score. Um, just to be clear, will the third method still mean one model or something like an ensemble of seven models? It's just one model. All that model can do is predict one day in advance. So you use it to predict one day in advance and then you take its output as data, shift it over and then predict one day in advance again. The reason why I didn't wanna show this for the RAIN data set is to use this approach. You would need all the features because with the RAIN data set, you're not just using the RAIN, you're using all the weather and humidity and wind and everything. And so you would need to actually predict the humidity for tomorrow and the wind for tomorrow and all that stuff in order to use this. And that just seemed like a lot of hassle. So I thought I'd show it to you on a, a simpler data set. Um, is this considered recursion? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Why not? Okay. I really want to blaze through some things before we end. So uh, I want to briefly talk about trends. Um, with this sales data set, you can see there's a trend here. The sales are going, there's a seasonal component that's probably around Christmas, the sales are higher or something like that. Um, but there's also a trend component that the sales just seem to be going up over time. And trends are their own important thing to think about with time series. Um, and our rain data set, the, the target was just a yes or no, is it raining tomorrow or not? So it's hard to make a plot like that and think about trends if it's just a yes or no that we're predicting. Um, and it's, it's a bit easier when you're predicting an actual number and you can make these types of plots. And so in that sense, I, I'm maybe not too happy with the rain data set, but um, what do I wanna say here? Um, will your model capture a trend? Well, if you have um, the feature encoded it, like we were encoding the day as a feature, like the Unix time thing, days since whatever. Um, so for the retail data set, we can have a days since the first day feature. And if you put that in, you can capture trends because for example, you're gonna have a coefficient for this column. If the coefficient is positive, then it's gonna say there's an overall, I know I'm mirrored when you're looking at me, there's an overall trend like this as uh, time passes. And so you're gonna be able to incorporate that into like a linear regression model, but just think carefully about what that's gonna mean. Like it, it, if it's a linear model and you're just putting time in there, it's gonna predict like a steady growth forever. And maybe that doesn't actually make sense for your application. Um, 
if you use a tree-based model like a random forest, it's all splitting on thresholds. So it's going to have a split that says, if the day is after 9,105, do this. But the random forest will not learn any kind of trend because the random forest is not going to make another split on time 9,200 or time 9,300 because you don't have any data for those later times. And so with the random, a linear model can learn like a linear trend, like it keeps going up over time or it keeps going down over time with this type of feature. But a random forest can't really learn that. It's just gonna learn, maybe it'll learn some trend over time, but then it'll just kind of keep things constant after the end of your training set because it has no reason to do any splits in cases where it doesn't have data. So. If I can get my act together later today, I want to add something about that on your homework for this week, but uh, TBD if I will be able to do that. So I just wanted to very quickly mention that. And of course, I know I'm rushing at this point, but at least I got it on record. So let me take the last three minutes to just say that time series is its own thing. We could have spent two lectures on it or five lectures on it. There's so much stuff we didn't cover. So there's like the whole stats -y approach. And if some of you have taken stats classes, you might have seen something like ARIMA models and such. That's a completely different approach to all this time series stuff. Um, there's the whole deep learning world. So we talked about neural networks and deep learning a few classes ago. There's all these RNNs and things like someone mentioned in the chat that have been pretty effective for uh, time series that we're also not going into in this course, but uh, there's CPSC 440, which is the follow on to 340 that does talk about this. Um, there's all different kinds of problems involving time series. I think you're very, very lucky, very, very likely to encounter problems with the time component in your future applied machine learning lives. Um, so something to think about. There's unequally spaced points. So we just had, you know, a value every month for sales or a value every day for the Australia, but you might get uh, time points at arbitrary times. Like when a user comes and interacts with your site, you create, you log that, and now you have arbitrary data points. And so you have to make, everything's different in that case. Cause for example, the lag features like one time step ago, two time step ago, uh, you might not have data at particular times on a grid. And so that's kind of its own hassle to deal with. And in many, many cases, you will have a regularly spaced time points and that's great. It makes your life easier. But when you approach a new problem, you have to ask yourself, are my time points regularly spaced? And if not, some of the stuff we talked about will not work so well. Um, I wanted to briefly mention this package called Profit. That's kind of a nice Python package. If you're doing time series stuff, what's nice about it, it's kind of a, a forecasting package. I think Facebook made it but it has things like holidays and stuff in there. So if, especially if you're forecasting things like human related, uh, it can be very convenient for you to, um, use for, to use for your forecasting problems. And um, the last thing is just a comment on feature engineering, which is again, most of what we did today was actually on feature engineering. Oh, that's not true anymore. Um, that was from last time. So most of what we did today was actually feature engineering. How do we take the, t the date and make features out of it? Should we one hot encode the months? Should we do days since the start? Should we ordinal encode the months? Should we do the sine and cosine thing? Uh, should we say winter or not winter? And then the lag feature stuff was also feature engineering. Um, should we take yesterday's humidity, the day before humidity? So um, I'll just reiterate that feature engineering is kind of like a very domain specific thing. And all the stuff we talked about here today was basically specific to the domain of time series. And for different types of data, there's different uh, approaches to feature engineering. That's it for today, we're out of time. Um, it was a bit rushed, but we got through it. I'll be releasing your homework seven very soon and I will see you on Thursday.